What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. You've got questions? O'Reilly Auto Parts has answers. Need a pro you can trust? We've got that too. No matter what you need, our professional parts people have the training and expertise to help you do things right. Deep automotive knowledge, just one part that makes O'Reilly stand apart. The professional parts people. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto Parts. Time, weather, and... This is King Caruso, and you're listening to the Black History Buff Podcast, a podcast about all things black and historical. Today's episode is a little different. Rather than my usual saunter through a specific point in time, today I'm doing an interview. Now, I don't normally do interviews for lots of reasons. They're difficult to organise, time zones are a nightmare, and if I'm honest, they remind me a lot of work. But my reluctance to do interviews were all put aside when I received an intriguing email. Dear Sir Slash Madam, I am the co-author of A Cry to War. My co-author and I would love to be invited to give an interview on your platform about African history, culture and what inspired us to write this book. Book you say? We are both of African descent but raised in the UK. I'm Nigerian and she is Ghanaian. Some background about it. Title, A Cry to War. It is an African book set in the 13th century West Africa before slavery. Like me, many Africans wonder what Africa looked like before any contact with the West. This book brings the lives of our ancestors back to life and retells a historical truth in a fictional world. It dramatises the conflicts, politics, triumphs and a number of West African kingdoms such as the Benin Kingdom, the Ghanaian Empire, the Malian Kingdom and the Fulani people. The story stretches across countries, seas and continents, showing the great variation in language, customs and traditions between tribes, but also the unity displayed by different characters to overcome adversity. Please see the attached press release and cover. Kind regards, Indiocena Odiesi. What? African? History? Tribes? Benin Kingdom? Ghanaian Empire? I had to find out more. So, after some toing and froing and a little bit of organisation and some, a bit of calendar coordination, I finally pinned Nosa down and we sat down and had a conversation via Skype. Now, because this is an internet recording, the audio is not up to my usual standards. Yeah, there, I said it, I admit it. You know how precious I am about my sound. But we had a great chat and I implore you to check it out. In the background, you'll hear the usual police sirens and chair scrapings that you get especially the police sirens that you get in any urban environment and yeah you know what guys i live in the hood so it kind of just is what it is all right so kick back relax and enjoy the interview we kick off with me asking nosa to introduce himself and to tell us a little bit about his background 
I'm not Swadiase. I'm Nigerian by origin. Um, both my parents are Nigerian. And basically, I'm by profession, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, currently, I reside in London. And, you know, as I'm sure a lot of us in the diaspora are, we're fascinated by African history and understanding sort of our roots and so on and so forth. And that, from when I was, you know, of a younger, of a, a lot younger in my teenage years, I've always sort of gone to museums and and try to try to understand my history, predominantly the Benin the Benin history because that's where my dad is from, and he's obviously he's over the years he's taught always made sure that I was connected to it, mm. and he's told me stories about ancient kings and ancient obas we call them in in the Benin kingdom. And, you know, and over the last few years, before I wrote the book, or before we wrote the book, we, I was sort of, you know, exposed to a lot of European um, literature. So you had, you had obviously The World of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin, yep, yep. which gave us Game of Thrones. You know, we had Lords of the Ring, mm-hmm. which, which I was a massive fan of when I was, mm-hmm. when I was a lot younger. Currently we have Vikings, which is a, also a huge TV show. And there's, there's lots of books, obviously, I would say, delving into sort of European history and European mythology. But as much as I like those books and I like those sort of TV shows, <clears throat> I don't feel like it does represent me as a person. Mm-hmm. And and looking at my own history, there is that amount of sort of um, content in there and amount of sort of history dating back um, hundreds and thousands of years, but I feel like there's not enough enough said about it. There's not enough um, books written about it, both fictional and non-fictional, and that obviously motivated us to say actually there's no, there's no point in us saying oh actually there's not enough black African people writing. We can actually take it on ourselves and actually affect the change. So. You know, I I love fantasy fiction as well. Like I I I grew up like one of the first books I read as a child. It's a quite a funny story. So I'm an undiagnosed dyslexic. So at school I had difficulty reading, right? And they would always put me in the bottom groups for everything. Mm. So I was very frustrated because not because of the group per se, but the other kids who were in the group for reading and writing that I was in. Hmm. Let's just say it was a challenging group. Okay, so we're going back a few <laughs> years before they really got into SEN and how to deal with autism and Asperger's and so forth. But I mm-hmm. would say, looking back on it now, those were the type of children I was in the room with. And as a as a young kid, probably like six or seven, I remember looking around the room and my little brain going, I don't match what's going on in this room I need to get out right so I asked one of the teachers and they said well when your reading improves we'll take you out so I remember I went to the school library that day and the first book I picked out was The Hobbit I I just literally went in to find the biggest book I could find remember I'm like six (laughs) or seven so I pick out The Hobbit um and I memorized the whole of the first chapter. I sat down and I was like, right, I'm memorizing this. Because because the words would dance when I read it um, yeah. live. So I memorized yeah. it that night. And so the next day I went in to school and I fake read the book from me- <laughs> but I'm actually reading from memory and then closed yeah. it and said, Can you take me out of the class? And they shifted me out. And so that kind of spawned one it made me realize from a very young age i was gonna have to work really hard at this whole reading thing and the second thing is is it spawned a love of fantasy fiction because i fell in love with that book and i became a massive tolkien fan and i understood all of that so the whole fantasy worlds and i read you know lord of the rings and wizard of Earthsea and all of those books and game of thrones and all of them so like when i came across when you when i got your email and i saw what you'd done I was like, this is right up my street. Like someone has grabbed hold of the narrative and taken control of it and decided that they're going to do African fantasy. And 
I couldn't think of anything better. I'm like, how much history and heritage is there to mine and explore? Like, why is this not a thing? There is so yeah, much there. We're, we're looking at goblins and wizards and made up lands when we actually have this rich pool of history to draw from. And it's just, it's in a, in a weird way, in an almost odd parallel. It's another resource, but it's one that hasn't been tapped. And Tap this one, all, yeah. you actually have like a clear run at it a yeah, credible yeah. and clear run at it so i think what you're doing is amazing and i think the reasons behind why you're doing it is amazing as well but a question i want to ask you is yeah. so you're an engineer student by trade yeah i'm in well i study engineering okay at king's college so, so, you, uh, so yeah so king's college a uh, very prestigious university in the uk renowned for producing doctors and people yeah. in the medical profession so i'm thinking you know you're a young man you're surrounded by doctors medical students you're studying <laughs> engineering how did you make the leap from looking at you know engineering hard science numbers facts to right i'm gonna write a fantasy african historical oh, novel wait. where does how does that happen where at what point you know what did you walk into a session and you were like eh, forget this i need to do this <laughs> how does that t- talk me through that process i mean no it's funny you asked that because someone else asked um another radio interview or something mm-hmm. the guy the nigerian guy asked me exactly the same question i think like we all we all have sort of our hobbies don't we like we even though like you might be you know you might find a banker who's interested in painting for instance mm-hmm. and it's the same way you'd find an engineer who's interested in writing yeah i mean before that I'd never written anything before and it was wow. kind of um my motivation for doing it I, as i explained before was because i wanted to tell an african story and that made me think okay <clears throat> As an engineer, the way you go about solving a problem is first you try and understand the problem, then you figure out a methodology of actually um, going about solving that problem, and then at the end of it, you find a solution. So me trying to write the story is me basically following the same process. So okay. it was literally, right, I haven't written anything before. Um, I've read quite a few books. What are the what are the processes of writing uh, a fictional book? So it was like you needed to carry out a lot of research about that that period in time, the customs of the people, the sort of terrain and the landscape in West Africa. So at this point in the interview, mentally, I couldn't help but be absolutely fascinated listening to Nosa, an engineer, break down what is usually seen as a creative process in such a logical and procedural way. And it really made me think about the way I conduct research for this podcast and made me realise that I follow a very similar path of identifying problems, completing research and testing theories until I find what feels like the right solution. Nose is a very smart guy and I think that way of thinking is is useful to all of us in any of our endeavours. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Back to Nosa. Understanding the mythology around it and then after I've done the research element of it, the next part was to try and understand um, how you write a story. So the story acts, the world building, the character development, and all of these sort of tools that basically kind of ties the entire story together. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, as it is a, a fictional book set in West Africa, as you know, West Africa obviously is a is a is a is a part of the world which is you know, he has various cultures and traditions. Like, yeah. even though we're all Africans, we speak different languages, of we course. sort of have different cultures and different traditions, even serve different gods, um, traditional gods even. So in that that instance, I needed to find a way in order to represent various aspects, uh, major West African tribes, ma- major West African cultures, and uh, major West African sort of mythology and tradition and represent them in a certain form in that book. 
but the entire process of of writing the story it may sound a bit crazy but it's similar to solving an engineering problem mm -hmm. because the problem was the problem is creating an african fantasy mm -hmm. and the sort of steps of solving that is the same way you solve an engineering problem okay so in yeah. terms of researching the culture and the history i mean obviously you've got your own background and knowledge to draw upon mm -hmm. uh, talk me through some of the research that you did and um in doing your research did you have any kind of like whoa moments where you thought i did not or anything you found that kind of like blew your mind well i, I would say i would say the vast majority of the time i was sort of like I it was a learning process more for me as well mm -hmm. as a writer because you know a lot of the a lot of the stories my dad told me was based on the bidding kingdom which is just one sort of representation in the story hi it's me again and i just wanted to interject to say if you're a studious person who likes to take notes and follow up on things and you've ever wondered where a good place might be to start researching into african history Get your notebook out now, as NOSA lists a number of kingdoms that are a great starting point for anybody wanting to learn more. We also have sort of the, the Songhai kingdom, which is what is current day Ghana. You've got um, the Malin, Malin kingdom, which is represented. You've got the Fulani people, the Yoruba people, and some major tribes that are represented there. So in order to, for me, whilst carrying out the research, I was able to learn a lot about these people and learn a lot about their history. And I was like, wow, there's a lot of sort of civilizations, ancient civilizations that we went, that I wasn't actually aware of. I mean, obviously there's, when you, when you talk about African history and sort of ancient Africa, you think of Egypt, that's the, <laughs> you know, they tend to be the main sort of focus. Yeah. But when you actually research other areas, you realize that actually there are more there's more there than you know you that than you've been led to believe. Mm -hmm. So it was it was definitely interesting, and the, the interesting part of it was not just in this book, but in the next book, I'm able to pull out some of those sort of I would say not just the history, but the influence of various aspects in Africa into the book, and and sort of. You, like I would be able to explore ex explore the the influence of um, Islam or the how Islam came into Africa and sort of the how they put the impact it had on sort of the traditional religions in the area, mm -hmm. good and bad, and also looking at various cultures that existed be before that. So like the sort of trans Saharan sort of the trans Saharan trade, mm -hmm. which also included various things like gold, as well as slaves, which I think is not as talked about as the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. So that's an, that's another aspect of the story, which 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 I found quite eye-opening and quite interesting because that was not something I'd read a lot about. So during this research, I was able to actually learn a lot, a lot about that. I think the important thing from a, from a Black point of Black African and a Black person's point of view is the the idea of you know sort of we having fully functional working civilizations because the one thing that is from from us quite a lot is the fact that so we 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 find it difficult as africans to to have really sort of functional strong governments that actually work for the people mm. and are not corrupt and you know uh, and researching and writing this sort of fictional books shows that we had civilizations dating back you know hundreds thousands of years that were actually ahead of their time and quite advanced and that was quite you know i knew about these but actually researching it more and understanding that there, there was actually more civilizations in different parts of west africa even different parts of africa is quite important i think because you know it shows that we had you know we, we had great civilizations, great empires that rose and fell. Um, most definitely, most definitely. I think there is a bit, a massive misconception between being technologically advanced and being civil. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and 
the the biggest misconception is that the continent of Africa wasn't civil and wasn't technologically advanced when the truth is, and probably as, as you've demonstrated in the book and, mm-hmm. and as you're saying now, is that they were both evident. So, so to stay on the book, because I could talk to you about you and, and yeah. your journey all day, right? So for the listeners, mm-hmm. give me a summary of what the book's about. Draw us into your world. Paint the picture. Right. So, so like a cry to war is, so the way I formed the story was based on a, an ancient king who actually did exist. Mm-hmm. It was called Oba Ewari the first. Mm-hmm. So it was an ancient Benin ruler. He had a quite interesting sort of rise to power and he kind of got driven away and then he came back and, and he fought his brother in order to, to get back in power at the time. So the main character here is called King Ewari, which is kind of a draw of him, but not the story doesn't explicitly follow his sort of real life mm-hmm. roots, basically, or story. So A Cry to War is formed of mainly five African kingdoms. And those five kingdoms represent different parts of sort of mainly West African. So you go like Mombaka, which is predominantly sort of the Benin and the Yoruba kingdom kind of put together. So you go Songhai, which mm-hmm. is the ancient Songhai kingdom, which is sort of modern day Ghana, which is represented in that area. You've got the Kinjaja kingdom, which is similar to what the Malian kingdom. And then you've got Ameria, which is similar to the, well, it has the Fulani tribe in there. And then you've got Bakuma kingdom, which is more sort of, I would say, Northern African, sort of like Moroccan, Tunisian sort of cultures in that area, and sort of the Mediterranean sort of cultures there. Now, in this book, you've got different, I don't want to spoil it too much, but you've got different mythologies. So they're all African mythologies. So you have like God of the sea, God of the sky, and, you know, that are represented in the traditional Olokun, Ogun, like the actual African names, and they follow the same sort of, the same mythology, effectively. So in this story, which is centered around King Elwari, he's a traditional African sort of, West African ruler. Mm-hmm. He's got he's got he's got two wives. He's got he's got two wives, five kids, and he's he's at a crossroad basically. So he's had peace for a certain amount of years. He had peace for twenty years after there's been a war mm-hmm. for a while where his dad died in battle fighting uh, a foreign ruler, and basically at this point his his wife wants him to get a revenge on the death of his father for her own sort of personal reasons. And he himself has an internal conflict in terms of he knows or he feels that his dad would be proud of him if he was able to get a revenge for his death. Mm. So he's kind of contemplating whether or not to maintain peace for the long run, because they've obviously had it for quite a significant amount of time or to actually go back to war. So he deals with that internal conflict for a while, and then he 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 he, he definitely then does a decides on that issue and takes a path which basically sets the story apart. So sometimes when you're doing interviews about books, it's really easy to kind of talk around the book, and you miss the essence of what the book is actually about. So I've taken it on myself to read a short extract from the beginning of the book. A Cry to War, Chapter 1, A Lion Asleep. The year of the lion, 1267 AD. King Oware threaded silently through the thick grass, so not to alert a stranded antelope of his presence. With the animal in his sight, he aimed his wooden spear with sharpened bronze teeth and waited patiently for the right moment to strike. The king's breath drew warm, Vision blurred with thousands of insects buzzing in front. His hand shook to his beating heart, but his gaze stood still, eager to not go home without a kill. Then came a gust of wind, blowing briskly across the field, washing away the swarm of insects and the antelope from his sight. Wondering where it went, Oware scanned the distant trees, his worn hands flooded with sweat, with more dripping down his chiselled face as the evening heat boiled. 
He knew if he flinched a muscle, the antelope would smell its almost certain death. So he continued searching, with eyes wide open darting from tree to tree. The animal must have sensed danger and purposely hid away. With the sound of a snapped branch, Aware regained his target. He inched closer to his prey, which was seemingly unaware of the impending hunter. Lost and alone, the creature must have separated from its herd and their protection. In an unexpected moment, the two had a second of eye contact. They stood still and unsure of the future. In a split second, the antelope sprinted away, but Aware remained still. The king aimed for the animal's heart and released his spear, sending it sailing through the tranquil Agbon forest. It followed a narrow but defined path cutting between tall, aged trees and thin branches before piercing the antelope's belly, crushing its ribs and narrowly missing its heart. The antelope fell to the wet forest floor with blood spurting into the warm air. Iwari rushed to meet his kill and sliced the animal's neck open with a merciful swish of his sword, relieving it of pain and of life itself. The king placed the animal on his bare back and marched home, pensive. So he's 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 got a, a father to avenge. He's got a wife or wives with conflicting opinions, and he's he's caught in the horns of a dilemma. Have I got that right? Yeah, that's true. But at the same time, he's. I mean, it's easy to say he's the main. He he. It's easy to look at the cover and look at the synopsis and think of him as the main character of the book, which in, to a certain extent he is, but the story doesn't center just around him. So obviously, like I mentioned, he had, he has a second wife who mm -hmm. was, had our motivations. So we tell how, what kind of developed that part of the story of why she wanted him to do that, what gain she would get if he does go to war and her motivations, where she came from. He has three sons, so we look into the sons because when, when you, in the in the traditional sort of sense, when you go to war, you, you send your sons. You send your sons. Obviously, you go with them, but setting sort of conflicts, you send your sons. It's a way of preparing them to take on the kingship, basically. So we explore the sons. We look at the journey and their friendship with locals and understanding what his decisions, eventual decisions, how he impacted on his kids, mm -hmm. how he impacted on the, the surrounding people and the journey they then, basically the journey they took afterwards. I don't wanna, I don't wanna spoil that, the story, no, but, no. but basically it's not a simple hero story uh -huh. um, that's centered around one person. It, it, does, it does break off and become more of a you, you you end up following different people okay. effectively. So you mentioned that the two wives. So there's two wives and two daughters as well, right? So how did you ensure that you were writing authentic female characters? I mean, like as a, as a male, how do you write from the <laughs> perspective of a of a black woman, a black queen, two black queens, <laughs> and princesses? <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you make sure you get that right? Well, you don't want to get killed out here on social media for, <laughs> for come on, one king, two wives. What, what's going on here? How did you make sure that you were keeping this authentic and getting a, 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 a real female's point of real. view? Because I, I got to well, stand on the side of the sisters here. So I have to apologize here. I think it's because I used the word male, but for some reason... I start to refer to women from this point on as females. It's a personal pet hate of mine. It, and it just seems to happen when guys get together to have conversations about women when there are no women around. And when I listen back to the audio, I've got to be honest and say I was mortified. I didn't want to cut it out because I think sometimes when you make mistakes, you should leave it out there as a personal record of what you did wrong. And if it doesn't annoy you, then fine. But it annoys me. And I just want to apologize to anybody else it annoys because it's a personal pet hate of my own. So, right, that's me. I'm out until the end of this interview. Please 
forgive me. All I can say is that I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. Obviously, as you're aware, the, the book is co-authored. Mm-hmm. So it was co-authored by an, by an African female as well. So, so that element of it was massively, so sort of, she had a massive influence in it. I bet she did. Um, so yeah, yeah, she did. Which does, I mean, yeah, I don't think, yeah, she had a massive influence in it. But at the same time, w- the original sort of core of the story was in sort of disparaging to uh, a black woman. Of course, um, of course, and, I didn't expect and there were there were black female heroes in the, in the in the story as well as they were in, as they are in real life at ancient times there were black warriors and um, female warriors and and there there is actually a black queen in the book was on kingdom so it is the female element of it is 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 raw and it is true because i'm not trying to be i'm not trying to be liked by everyone because there will there will be elements of it that you might find someone might find or oh, actually in this current climate you might think oh actually that is not very sort of PC. Talk but to at me the about same that. time, yeah. Talk to me but about not PC. <laughs> What's not PC? But at the same, t- <laughs> but at the same time, it is it is true to the sort of the African heritage at mm-hmm. that time, uh, because obviously the Af- African heritage at the time was and. To a certain extent, still is a man. Obviously, is in charge. Mm-hmm. You know, the birthright belongs to the man. If you if you have a son, he goes first before the woman. So, if you had like a, you had like three girls first, and you had the last born son, he would mm-hmm. be king ahead of all ahead of all the girls, which he still is today. To, to, till today, you also have in certain cultures, not all cultures, but in certain cultures in Africa, you have this idea that women are not meant to go to war, are not meant to ride horses or, or camels and so on and so forth. Whereas in other areas in Africa, you have it where women go to war yeah. and they fight. And so, so there are elements, there are both elements basically. The elements that you might find actually this is not right in the elements okay. way where you agree with but it is telling the story the way it actually is like you know it's not trying to pander to a certain narrative so how, it's basically how, telling how, how, many, how many fights were there between you and your co-author about the <laughs> polygamous relationship how did, how did that work out she, Come she on, was give she, it to she, me she, she, <laughs> No, actually, she was she was she was, she agreed with it completely. Okay. She because because she understood. I mean, obviously, she understood the time and period it was written, mm-hmm. and she understands that you know an African king having two wives is actually a, it's quite small, to be honest. A lot of <laughs> could have had more. <laughs> a, a, a lot of them do have quite a few, and still do to today. Yeah. So you know, it's quite common for people to have more than one wife because you must remember, and the reason why this book is written is to show the lives of the people mm-hmm. at that period of period of time, not at in today's time climate. And I need to stay true to that. Obviously, I did not not trying to be overly sort of rude to a female, for instance, but just tell the story as it is, which shows male male heroes, female heroes. Um, young heroes and old heroes, you know, in that in that fashion, and also shows people losing as well and dying in both sort okay. of. You know, it's balanced in that sense. Yep. So have war, people die. Um, so yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot now. 2020, we're here now. Mm-hmm. Would you have two wives? 2020, two twos. Would you have two wives in 2020? Well, me personally yeah, today, <laughs> King. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, as a Christian, no, nah, yeah, <laughs> no. Nah, I would. One wife is enough for me. One wife is enough. Okay. <laughs> I fully agree. I can only handle one. Hats off to those who can handle who? more than one. I'm good with my solo right now. Um, okay, I had to ask. I had to ask. Okay, so. Um, I'm, I'm staying on, on that topic so out of you yeah. and your co-author who wrote the sex scenes because there is sex in this book it's an adult book and I'm, I'm going to stress this now it, it's an adult book just as you would find in it's nearer to Game of Thrones than you would find to Lord of the Rings um, Lord of the Rings is is 
PG compared to the triple X rated Game of Thrones. And, <laughs> you know, I I, I, I I did read the book and I, I use a screen reader and I had it reading out loud and my son walked in on the middle of a very graphic sex scene, like lit, hearing it out in audio. He didn't walk in on it himself. But so who who wrote those and and why are they in there? So <laughs> why are they in there? Yeah, tell me. It's a, it, again, it's a, it's, so you, you could have left them out. They're not in the Hobbit. They're yeah, in could, all I books. You could have decided to make this for younger readers, but you've, you've gone the other yeah. route. So you, they're in there for a reason. Yeah. So if I wrote, I well, I wrote it, and she wrote, obviously edited it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a both. It's, it's both. In certain elements, I would say. But why are they in there? I would say I was as a as a writer. I wanted to show. I wanted to develop on the relationships that happen between people. And obviously that includes both sort of them as characters interacting with themselves, mm-hmm. facing challenges together. And at the same time is the intimacy between them mm-hmm. and how that intimacy is explored. And I felt like if I took that out, I, I, I don't think the overarching story will be, will change, but as a reader, I'll feel like it doesn't show how close those characters are mm. and there are there are certain sex scenes that are not how do i put it they're in there to tell a particular story oh, cool. yeah which affects affects it because someone is doing something which you wouldn't say is is right basically it's not yeah, yeah. so there's no rape scenes or anything like that but it's just uh it's there to tell a certain story yeah. um, about that character and there is a sex scene that is meant to show a character going through a phase in her life. I don't think you've reached there yet. No, but I haven't reached there. It's meant to go through a phase in her life. And the sex scene is not just, it's, the sex scene is less about the actual sex, but more about her feeling whilst she was having that sex, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect so it was, sense. It was, so it, you know, I, I asked. If, I asked if that makes sense. It makes it makes perfect sense to me, and and I asked the question specifically because in my own research of you know African history and Pan African history, one of the things that I often struggle to find are love stories. There yeah, are very it's, 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 few love stories. We have the, yeah. you know, you mentioned earlier before about Egypt. We have Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Mm-hmm. what who 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 cares about that like yeah, and yeah. you know we have we have more modern tales but going back into ancient history or should i say pre transatlantic slavery history there are very few love stories to find and just love stories no. in general and i feel that very much in terms of black culture pan african culture the love sex story is, like term, is yeah. sex. Sex is there. Yeah. Sex is there. Sex is in the music. It's in the dance. Sex and sexuality mm. is there. But yeah. often love is missing. Yeah. And I, you know, I, 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 I like the fact that in the book you have both. There is love and there is sex. You know, there is marriage, the relationship. They're fully fledged three dimensional 360 degree relationships and we get to see the good the bad the ugly and the reality um, exactly and so which I'm, which I'm, i think mm-hmm. which i think is the reason why i left it because when when in the whole process of writing well when i was writing it the one thing that obviously crossed my mind was like you said um it's kind of like a thing where we especially africans in the continent they're not used to romantic stories and reading about reading sex in their books yeah. is is not common. And I was thinking, should I actually leave it in there? Because some people are gonna be like, mm, I'm not sure. And and Karen, uh, my co-author, she's like, we definitely need to leave that in there. Because mm-hmm. it is a it is a part of the story. You're like you said, it's a three-dimensional story. It's meant to show the story as it is, like the the good, the bad, the ugly parts of it. And the sex is is in that. And he tells the whole thing without trying to clean it up or mm. trying to make it shit to a certain audience. And 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 that's the reason why I think 
it is in there. And since it's been out, it's been out for about two months now, about two months, just over two months. I've I have had feedback, both positive and people who were like, oh, actually, I didn't. I didn't expect to read the sex scenes because they're not used to reading African stories with that element in it. And there are people who are like, I read it and that's the part I actually like the most mm. in the book. So, you, you know, you're always going to have that. You're going to have people who would like it and people who wouldn't like elements of the story. But the, the most important part of it is as a writer and someone who's telling the story is to tell the story as it appears to you. So that way, I don't. F- at the end of it, I don't feel like I've cheated myself, and I don't feel like I've cheated the story itself by telling, by you know, cutting out bits of it. Yeah, I, and, I, and I think that's. I'll probably go in the same route for the second and the third book. Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah. you you you've said you've used that phrase a, a few times. Tell the story. Tell the story. Right. So so what what do you want the readers of this first book? to come away with how would you like them to feel by the time it, by the time they reach at the the end of the story once you've told the story <laughs> you know what what do you want them to come away with how do you i think yeah i, I think and and obviously right now a lot of people quite a few people read back read it and got back to me about how they felt mm-hmm. i had quite a few african-americans read it and they felt like positively overwhelmed there's a lady who recorded a video and was like wow because the reason why she felt that way was the both the style of writing and the the objective of the writing is to place you in the world so like i'm trying to get the reader to picture what life was like in the 13th century because the book is is to show the lives of our ancestors at that period in time. There's a there's obviously a story that continues right the way through, but in that story, you're placed in the world. It's built around you. You're able to picture what the sky looks like, how tall the trees are, the sort of animals, the, what the houses are built of, you know, kind of the 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 cost um, the costumes the characters are wearing. You know, you picture the world and you feel like you're in the story. And and at the end of the at the end of the book, what I want the character the, the readers to come out with is understanding the most important thing is that we had as Africans, we had African civilization and we had trade with other king between kingdoms, understanding we had a hierarchical system that was fully functional with a king at the top and his subjects below him and, and so on and so forth. But most importantly, what the story would give them is an ability to picture that world, to, to be able to picture that civilization, to feel like you were you were actually in there. And I think that that's what that's the feeling they'll get at the end. Okay. And, and why is it important for you that people come away with that ability to picture the world and be able to see it? Because I think it's very important that we as Africans tell our own stories because we we are the only ones who are able to do it real justice. And the more we are able to tell our stories and the more we're able to write about these sort of pre-historical, pre, sorry, pre-slavery, um, pre-colonial Africa is... By the time you read one book, you have a picture of what the world was like. You read another book, you have another picture. You know, it kind of builds that idea in your head about what African history is without having to have it memorized in your, in your head. It's just like, it's just the same way you and I understand what European history is. We understand how the Romans with went through. We understand the Anglo-Saxon history, the, the Viking history, because there's been so much literature written about it. So the more we're right, the more we're writing this story, both fictional and non-fictional, in wherever form it comes in, it paints that picture in people's minds. And the more stories are written, the more that's that the, the that picture gets cemented in in our consciousness. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you some 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 light questions now. Okay, quick fire. So firstly. Have you seen Gods of Egypt? I looked at that film. I didn't like it. 
So I, did, I didn't watch the whole thing. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which character in the book is most like you? It's most like that's just a good question. I think I, I don't want to say this. Say it. People would pick when you read it, you probably tell. Say it. But um, it's Airwaker. Airwaker is an interesting character. And I, uh, if you read it, you know who Airwaker is. But Airwaker is like he's not a prince, so he's not. Say no more. Say anything. no more. They've got to read the but, book. Airwaker. Yeah. Okay. Right. Has your mum and dad read the book? Yeah, my dad has read it quite a few times actually. <laughs> He keeps asking me why I'm going to write the second one. Okay. What did mom and dad say yeah. about the sex scenes? My, my dad said he liked the book. He said he liked it. That he, he, he thinks that it was right that I left that in there um, because it is part of the story. Fantastic. And he, he's read it a few times. So. Dad, he's read it a few times. Yeah. So daddy, he's proud of you. Good job. And mum? <laughs> She is. She's always she's always messaging people about the book. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Favorite food. Favorite food would be pounded yam and you can Oh good answer. Okay. <laughs> Gonna mix it up a bit now. So there's a football match. You brought up here. It's England versus Nigeria. Which side are you trying to Okay. The reason why so, no is reason because to, 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 uh, no 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 but we need we need to say it right <laughs> like like we have like Nigeria has like even most African countries have struggled in the World Cup and so on so I think we we do obviously we do need to improve but yeah definitely because we, like England has won the World Cup <laughs> once <laughs> what <laughs> I'm telling you the first African country to win it we ain't handing it back okay so yeah. England versus Jamaica which side are you cheering on. England versus Jamaica is, is have to be Jamaica. Good answer. We like you here. Okay. Yeah, okay. Jamaica. Now this is a harder one for you. Jamaica versus Ghana. Oh, <laughs> that's a hard one. That is a hard one. I don't know. I don't know what they got me. Ha! I'll go Jamaica actually. Yeah. I'll go Jamaica. Yeah. I'll go Jamaica. We get, we get, we get, I get, we get too much um, beef about with Ghana and Jello fries. He's telling us how their Jello fries is better. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, where can people buy the book, and how can they find you if they want to know more? So they can go on our website, which is gajerianpublishing.com. So it's G H A G E R I A N Publishing. Um, dot com so p-u-b-l-i-s-h-i-n-g dot com one word fantastic gadget and publishing or you can just go on amazon and search for the title a cry to war or search for my name or diase or d-i-s-e and it should come up and yeah wherever you are in the world you should be able to get a book fantastic and when is the next one coming up <laughs> That's a good question. I've started working on it. Just started. It should be out towards, I would say, early part of next year, okay. 2021. Okay, so we're yeah. not on a Game of Thrones 17 no, years no, later. No, 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 no. It's, uh, it's either either the right at the end of this, like Christmas this year or early part of next year. But yeah, around that sort of period. Fantastic. All right, yeah. brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the episode and thank you for continuing to support the show. If you haven't already, please subscribe and leave a review on whatever app you're using to hear my voice. I would love it if you joined me on Patreon or Podfan where you can listen to dozens of bonus episodes and the full uncut version of this interview. You can join for as little as one pound There are no long-term commitments and each contribution helps to keep the show ad-free. You can find links in the description. Oh, and one last thing. Thank you to a girl from Cleveland, Ohio, a lovely blunder nits and tone deaf musical for leaving me some really lovely comments on social media. You've been listening to the Black History Buff podcast, a production from BHB Media. When you visit Arizona, time is measured in moments, not minutes. Like the moment your work stress disappears as you kayak through the canyons. 
or the moment you discover the life-changing effects of prickly pear chocolate. But nothing beats the moment you see the Grand Canyon for the very first time. Visit a new state of mind. Learn more at hereyouareaz.com.